Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Sakshi Saki. I manage the OIDA membership program here at OSA. I'm really excited to introduce today's presentation. It's by one of our corporate members, Menlo Systems. Um, but before we get started, I just want to take a minute to review a couple of housekeeping items. So if you need any assistance on today's uh, webinar, uh, please use the chat icon. It's located at the bottom of your screen. You can just click it, send me a message there directly. I'd be happy to assist you. Um, we also really encourage you to ask any of our speakers some questions during the webinar. We have a couple of experts on the line who will be answering questions throughout the webinar during um, Nicola's presentation. Um, and if we have time at the end, we will also have um, time for some Q&A as well. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a second button. It says q and Please be sure to type your questions for the speakers directly in the Q&A not in the chat box, um, as I will only be checking the chat box. And then the final reminder is that we are recording today's webinar. Um, it's being recorded so that we can make it available to everyone online after today's presentation. So if you are unable to stay for the whole thing, you'd like to rewatch it later for it to a colleague who was unable to attend, you will be more than welcome to do so probably in about a day or two once we get the recording posted online. And in just a moment, I'll send you a link in the chat box on where you can find that. Um, so that's everything that I have for housekeeping notes. Um, I'd like to introduce and turn things over to our moderator, Patricia Kaur. She's with uh, Menlo Systems and she will get us started. Thank you. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to the second part of our webinar mini series on high precision metrology. Thank you, Sakshi, for introducing us, and thank you to the OSA for hosting us. Let me br briefly introduce who we are and what we do. Menlo Systems was founded nearly 20 years ago as a spin off company from the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in Garching, which is near Munich. We are developing and manufacturing lasers and laser stabilization for high precision metrology applications. Our company is known for the optical frequency comp technology, which Professor Hench, our co-founder, has received the Nobel Prize for in 2005. Our headquarters are in the west of Munich in southern Germany, and we hold offices in the US and in China. We serve our customers worldwide with applications in science and in industry. Our main product line are optical frequency combs, which are unique in terms of stability, accuracy and reliability. Next in the line are frequency stabilized lasers, which will be the topic of today's webinar. Um, they provide sub Hertz line width at nearly any wavelength. We combine them with our frequency combs into complete systems for quantum technology. Our further product lines are solutions for terahertz time domain spectroscopy, as well as systems for timing distribution in large facilities. We also offer femtosecond fiber lasers as standalone devices. We use our patented figure nine mode locking technology to ensure highest stability and low noise performance. Our speakers for today will be Dr. Nikola Butsalovic, who will be the main speaker. He is product manager of our ultra stable laser division. Nikola has profound experience in laser physics. He graduated in physics at the University of Belgrade in Serbia. He earned his PhD at the time and frequency laboratory at the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland and had a postdoc position at the ELI Beamlines in Prague in Czech Republic before he joined Menlo Systems in December 2019. Assisting with the Q&A session will be Dr. Doug Schmidt, product manager from Optical Frequency Combs, and Dr. Maurice Lessing, group leader, ultra-stable lasers. We would like to encourage you to submit your questions during the webinar and to take part, part in the polling later on. With this, I would like to hand over to Nicola. Uh, hello, everybody. I would like to thank uh, Sakshi and Patricia for, for their assistance and introductions. 
And um, uh, our second part of, of our mini webinar series is today uh, named the physics and the techniques of laser stabilization. Um, previously, we were speaking about more theoretically about the general, uh, general time and frequency domain uh, language and the techniques. And now we are going to go more deeper into what's happening uh, inside the, the reference cavity and the, in the process of laser stabilization. So my today's talk has um, uh, um, the first part, just a very quick uh, review of, uh, of uh, things that we touched the last time as an introduction as some kind of connection. So we don't jump directly to the to the new to the new stuff, and then um, I will speak about uh, a, a reference cavity that is used for laser stabilization, and then uh, I will uh, uh, use the opportunity to present a little bit of of uh, Menlo Systems products that are basically uh, taking um, uh, the 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 results of of many years of development and uh, putting it into a product grade uh, uh, um, in environment. And then I will show uh, at the end uh, two, two interesting applications that, that um, are connected with our, uh, with our uh, systems. And uh, finally, we will have, um, we will have a, a short polling questions. And then after that, uh, we will have a, a, a short live demo. Uh, that we um, had to pre-record because of the, the movement of our company from one office building to the other. So uh, it, was, it was tricky to find the time slot. So, so it was not uh, possible to make it really live. So we, we pre-recorded it. So yeah, uh, let's start with our story. As I said previously, in uh, one week ago, when you are dealing with uh, some kind of oscillator, this system is uh, uh, subject to to different kinds of interactions with, uh, with the environment, uh, temperature sensitivity, vibrations, uh, shocks and whatever. And finally, when you engineer your, uh, your system properly, uh, uh, you see some kind of behavior that is presented here on the, on the right side of the, of the slide. You, you are left over with the residual, residual effects and with some random short-term instabilities. So today we are going to see what are the residual effects uh, in, a, in a, a reference cavity that is used to stabilize the laser. And uh, why do we do that? Because uh, you should think uh, all the time in the background of our activity that we are, we are uh, doing optical frequency metrology. So last time I introduced what an optical clock is. Uh, it's a thing that comprises of some atomic reference, a frequency comb, so stabilized femtosecond laser that is used to measure optical frequencies, and then a, a ultra stable narrow line width laser that is used as a local oscillator for, for the optical clock. And uh, uh, we, we want to see how do we stabilize the laser to the reference cavity. So basically this means that you are frequency locking the, the laser cavity, the, the, the cavity that uh, encompasses the laser gain to an external super rigid and stable piece of glass. And then uh, when this is properly done, uh, everything that happens to the, to the external uh, uh, cavity uh, in terms of the length changes is directly transferred to the frequency change of the stabilized laser. So now, uh, previously, we were, we were thinking uh, about the cavity just as, a, as an object uh, that is used for stabilization without going too much into detail. But now we would like to deconstruct the cavity into, into its functional blocks. So uh, it's not just a, a single piece of glass. Uh, the reference cavity is comprised of a, of a specially designed spacer. It, uh, it has uh, two optically contacted mirrors on the spacer. And also it is important to, to properly 
uh, design and engineer mirror coatings, high reflection coatings in order to get the, the high finesse cavity. So uh, all three functional elements can be made out of different materials and we will reflect a little bit about that today. So um, um, a typical high finesse cavity has a very low, very low uh, losses in some parts of a million, parts per million. And this results in the, in the reflectivity that is kind of in the range of these five nines and, uh, and the finesse of the cavity, which is the, the completely dependent on the, on the reflectivity of the mirrors is a very uh, sensitive function of the reflectivity. So if you change the reflectivity, for example, in the last number nine, uh, instead of having a finesse of 250,000, uh, you will immediately, if you change it to eight, uh, you will immediately go to the finesse of 150,000. So you see how important uh, it is to have extremely low losses uh, in in the in the mirror coatings and uh, in the in this assembly, what uh, I would like to point out here, without going in all of the details, is that uh, once the resonator is constructed with these super reflective mirrors, uh, we end up with the line width of the uh, cavity resonances in the in the range of kilohertz, and this is important because we are using. Uh, uh, pound rover hole uh, technique to stabilize the laser. And uh, this technique uh, is, uh, modulate, uh, is, is, operating, uh, you are, uh, is operating with a modulated light that you shine into the cavity. And uh, this modulation frequency is usually in the range of some megahertz. And having a cavity that uh, has a, a resonance line width of, of the order of kilohertz, you you can uh, intuitively immediately understand that these side bands are reflected completely from the front mirror of the cavity. And uh, therefore, with the, by the interaction of the reflected side bands and the leakage of the carrier that is resonant with the cavity, you get a uh, uh, <clears throat> unique uh, pound river hole signal, which is basically your frequency discriminator which tells you how much, uh, which, which gives a signal proportional to the, to the change in the frequency of the laser. And this factor of proportionality depends directly on the uh, line width of the resonance, therefore on the finesse of the cavity. And that's why we are interested in having uh, as much uh, high finesse as possible, because we would like this, this discriminator to be as, as high as possible. Discriminator is this thing here. So um, now that we have uh, reviewed the uh, uh, pound river hole, we uh, will go more in details of what is uh, actually um, happening with the cavity and how to pre prepare the reference cavity. So uh, being a macroscopic object, uh, Fabri Perot interferometer is uh, is a subject to multitude of, of effects uh, that are basically uh, narrowing down to, to one thing that is important for us. And this is the length of the cavity change. So all of these effects are contributing to the uh, relative change of the length of the cavity. So uh, first I will speak about just uh, kind of uh, things that are uh, having uh, simpler solutions. For example, uh, refractive index change uh, uh, is dependent on the pressure uh, of, the, of the residual gas in the vacuum chamber. So in order to have a, a low changes in the optical path, uh, we need to take care about uh, reaching the pressure levels that are at the order of 10 to the minus seven or 10 to the minus eight millibars, which then introduce fluctuation in the optical length change uh, of the order 
of uh, 10 to the minus 16, which are sufficient for the level of stability that we want to reach. For those of you who might have not been around uh, uh, previous time, uh, number of about uh, 10 to the minus 15 should uh, should resonate in your mind. This is kind of the <clears throat> this is kind of the range of stability that we are uh, uh, aiming at operating at. So from mid 10 to the minus 16 to mid 10 to the minus 15. So we want our cavity length changes to uh, be in that range or lower in order to not deteriorate the performance of our laser that should follow the cavity. So uh, then uh, again, of course, we have um, another effect which is the aging of the material that is used to make the, the spacer of the cavity, for example. So without going in too much of the exotic details, uh, our cavities are using the ultra low expansion glass. It's a special type of, of glass uh, based on, I think, uh, titanium and silicium oxide. And uh, uh, this, uh, this type of material, when it's, uh, when it's new, it has a, a little bit higher uh, rate of uh, recrystallization and uh, therefore induces a higher drift uh, in the cavity. And uh, when it ages and uh, when it's old, it reaches this level of uh, something like 30 millihertz per second. And this is, if you remember plots in Allen deviation, from the last talk, this is seen as the long-term drift in the, in the frequency stability. So uh, uh, this effect is uh, uh, something like five times stronger uh, in, in new systems that we produce, but as the time goes by, it exponentially decays and, it, and finally after some years, it reaches this level. Then uh, the next uh, kind of uh, simple simple thing to deal with is the acoustic noise, uh, basically uh, some kilohertz uh, level vibration from, from 20 hertz to some kilohertz or 10 of ki tens of kilohertz uh, are very easily damped by, by simply, simply putting the, the reference cavity enclosure inside of the additional um, uh, specially designed acoustic isolation box. So that's not a big deal, but um, uh, it should be done. And then uh, we are reaching the point of, um, of um, more complicated stuff, which is vibrational sensitivity uh, of the cavity. So uh, uh, basically uh, nothing is super rigid and absolute in nature and especially not this uh, mic microscopic uh, uh, piece of glass. So therefore this object has certain sensitivity to acceleration. Uh, in each direction, X, Y, and Z. So in order to deal with that, um, it is important to, to have an active, active uh, vibration is isolation within the system. And also it is possible to play with the design of the, of the spacer, which we will see in a couple of slides, in order to make it immune to, to uh, uh, vibrations, yeah. Uh, then uh, further, we have macroscopic kind of uh, thermal effects because the every object, every every uh, object is uh, subject to, to thermal expansion or shrinking. And uh, as I mentioned, the uh, the, the uh, material of choice uh, for for our activity is this uh, ULE ultra low expansion glass, which. Uh, which uh, has um, uh, zero expansion coefficient or close to zero expansion coefficient at room temperature. And I will also show that. And uh, of course, to minimize the length of the cavity changes due to the temperature fluctuation, we have to have uh, either passive uh, or active uh, temperature shielding of the cavity. And then finally, uh, I think that all of the mentioned stuff uh, can be, um, can be, uh, let's say, called the uh, uh, engineering part. But then we are reaching a, a thermal effects on a micro scale, which is a fundamental limit of the stability that you can reach. And it is, it is um, based on the Brownian motion in the, in the material that is used to construct the cavity. So the only thing that you can 
use is uh, find materials that are having lower mechanical loss and construct cavity with uh, with different uh, different components, different materials. And I will briefly briefly mention some of the of the possibilities. But this is this basically uh, Brownian motion. So everything is possible to deal with in some kind of engineering way, except of Brownian mo uh, motion that that is there to stay. So you can ba basically cool the stuff, go to cryogenic temperatures, but we are aiming at operating at room temperatures. So we will see how to deal with that and what it means. So, uh, yep. Um, first, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we are using ultra low expansion glass. And uh, in this graph, you can see in this a uh, little bit uh, more, more rough graph, you can, you can see that this material has a, a, a change of the sign of the uh, coefficient, coefficient of thermal expansion somewhere in the region of the, of the room, room temperatures. If you, if you zoom in closer, you can see that the slope of, of this dependence is, uh, uh, is uh, at the, the level of parts per billion per Kelvin. Kelvin. So uh, in order, you, you want to operate your, uh, your system. You want to find the temperature where the, where the, the reference cavity has, a, has a, a minimum or probably it's possible to have a maximum depending on the way you, you measure the frequency. And uh, in the point of, in the graph of the frequency of the beat detection uh, against the temperature change, you can find the point where it has a, a, a minimum or maximum. And you would like to operate your system at that temperature because this temperature corresponds to the, to the zero expansion of the whole cavity assembly. But, uh, the cavity assembly can be, for example, made out completely of ULE. So uh, it can be made out of the spacer made out of ULE and the mirror substrates can be made out of ULE. When you, when you optically contact, you have a chunk of glass that is kind of homogeneous in material. And, uh, and uh, in, in, that, uh, in that configuration, you can expect to have your temperature of, of uh, zero CTE around uh, uh, between 25 and 35 degrees. I think that I somewhere saw that, that ULE is specified to have zero CTE between three and 35 uh, degrees centigrade. But, but basically what we are usually dealing with is, is in between 25 and 35. Then if you, use, uh, if you want to improve the performance of, of your system by using some other material, material with the lower mechanical loss in order to reduce the, the limitations of the, of the uh, in, in order to reduce the Brownian motion in the cavity, you can make a kind of a sandwich structure like making a, um, a using ULE spacer with a few silica, for example, mirrors in two slides or three slides, I will show the, the reason why. And uh, in that case, uh, the, the, the temperature of the zero crossing shifts towards the lower temperatures. And uh, uh, in this kind of assembly, you, we have seen that it goes between uh, 15 or 20 something degrees when you, when you make a, when you make a, a cavity um, uh, out of different materials. I would just like to point out that in this case, if you use a if you use a uh, um, few silica uh, mirror uh, substrates, uh, in order to, to avoid uh, drastic deformations, uh, Thomas Leguero has come up with the, with the idea to use the uh, ULE compensation rings on the back of the mirror. So therefore you kind of can tune and control the, the, the thermal properties of your, your cavity. So in this case, uh, we have a, 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 we have a, uh, a graph of the dependence of such a sandwich structure cavity made out of uh, ULE plus few silica plus compensation rings. And you can see that it's around 20 degrees. So the further, I, I have to take care about the time. Uh, it is important to, 
to properly deal with, uh, as I said, the vibration uh, sensitive, sensitivity of the cavity. So uh, we are basically dealing with, with two types of cavities uh, in our product. So the first one is a cylindric cavity. And you can see here that by uh, changing the position and uh, the, uh, of, of cavity mounting or uh, support points, uh, going towards uh, more symmetric uh, mounting, you can improve the performance the, and the lower the sensitivity to, to acceleration uh, with the factor of 100 and uh, reach, the, reach the, the sensitivity at the level of some, um, of some uh, uh, few pieces of 10 to the minus 11 per G. So uh, my complete idea with doing these uh, webinars is also to to clarify some uh, some confusing uh, terms that I also had problem to to catch up with. So when people just as a, as a short uh, uh, note on this, when people speak about vibrational sensitivity at the level of ten to the minus eleven per g, this means sometimes it's 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 avoided to to mention that it means the relative length change, therefore relative frequency change. Uh, at the level of, of 10 to the minus 11. So usually when you stabilize the system, you are left over with the residual micro G's. So you see that, uh, that you, you end up with the, uh, at the level of, of length and stability of the order of 10 to the minus 17, which is below uh, the level that we want to, to achieve in the laser stability. So, um, uh, the other type of the spacer that we use is, uh, and that is interesting, is a cubic spacer, uh, NPL designed uh, with the length of 50 millimeter. And uh, this, this design is uh, really possible to, to make uh, into a rigid mounting because it's uh, force insensitive and uh, provides a real robust uh, uh, reference cavity for laser stabilization. I think it, the, the, the motivation for this was also the space application. And um, uh, yeah, uh, with this kind of, of uh, 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 cavity, uh, I chose, uh, I chose the, the highest, the worst actual uh, dependence. So you, you end up with uh, with the uh, vibration sensitivity of the level of two ten, uh, two ten to the minus eleven per g. Um, uh, two other axes are uh, one order of magnitude less sensitive, but this one contributes probably the most. So I, I in order not to have too much uh, numbers, I cho chose the, the the highest number, yeah? the the one that limits the performance the most. And um, finally, as I mentioned. The, the, the thermal noise limitation of the, of the performance uh, and the, and the uh, effect on, on the stability of the, of the laser. Uh, as, as Feynman would have said, uh, everything jiggles and wiggles inside. So uh, basically on the, on the presumptions of some uh, uh, theoretical idea of this fluctuation dissipation theorem, one can, uh, one can uh, deduce um, uh, as I mentioned before, some of my, you might remember um, when I spoke about the uh, power spectral density of, of uh, certain value, of fluctuation of certain value. In this case, you can deduce a power spectral density of the length fluctuation of each of the components of the cavity. And you can see that the, the, the length fluctuation of the spacer substrate and the coatings all contribute and all are proportional to the mechanical loss of the materials that are used. Therefore, if, you, if we want to improve the performance of our cavities to reduce the level of, of length uh, fluctuation, the uh, length noise, we can opt out to use some uh, materials with the uh, with lower mechanical losses. And therefore I mentioned few silica as mirror substrate. And also in, in the domain of the coating, our, our uh, standard IBS, the electric coating are considered as a standard, but if you really want to, to push the, the performance to the uh, meaningful commercial limit, I'm not speaking about the research laboratories, uh, 
um, uh, you can use uh, crystalline coatings based on, on monocrystalline semiconductor materials and then improve the, the losses, mechanical losses in the coating. And therefore we, we play with all of this with uh, basically we don't change the material of our spacers, but based on the user needs, we either use the electric coatings or crystalline coatings, or we used ULE substrates or fused silica substrates for the mirrors. And uh, once you add up the contributions of all of these length uh, noise components, um, this all translates to the frequency, frequency noise. And in a, a certain, in such a, a shape of the frequency noise that results with the flat line in Allen deviation for all integration times. And this is called a simply thermal noise floor because the frequency noise has, a, has a, a, I think one over F dependence or a, um, one over, uh, yeah, um, frequ frequency or phase noise. Now I, I forgot the exact, uh, um, it does not matter. Uh, dependence of one over F translates to the to the um, uh, flat line in the Allen deviation. And uh, uh, here you can see uh, when you properly design and operate your laser, you are able, you are able to reach basically the, the thermal noise floor and uh, you cannot do better than this. So yeah, so this is the fundamental limitation of the cavity performance. Now that I have spent almost 25 minutes for this, I will switch to uh, quickly introducing you to our uh, product. And uh, first I would like to show you how it looks like when you want to do it yourself. This is what I did. Uh, basically, uh, uh, the idea was to construct an ultra stable laser from scratch, but not a, from total scratch. There was all, already some uh, pre-design uh, with the first system that you can see in the background. So I built the complete system uh, uh, that is closer to us. And uh, uh, you know, uh, when you are doing it yourself, this is very far from from the level of integration that you can that you can achieve uh, uh, from uh, from a company product, a corporate product, where all the things have been taken care of in uh, in, in order to make it reproducible and that you can really guarantee the performance and make the users happy. So uh, I, would, uh, I would recommend uh, uh, rethinking uh, uh, design from scratch, uh, maybe in some cases not fully, but we support you even in, in that way. But uh, first let's take a look, uh, let's take a look and, and in our um, product selection matrix. <clears throat> yeah, uh, uh, this one uh, you can you can see in the slides and the whole slides concerning the Menlo products. You can see in the in the additional in the additional data that you will get uh, uh, receive a link or either it will be on the website um, uh, of the of the talk. So you can see that by changing uh, by choosing the mirror substrates, mirror coatings, you can you can uh, you can choose different level of performances in between 0 0.7, 10 to the minus 15 and uh, 5, 10 to the minus 15. So uh, our big system is a, a, a subhertz la uh, line width laser uh, 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 operating with a 12 centimeter cylindrical cavity. Uh, important thing to say is that, uh, the, that this system uh, has a transportation locking mechanism. Uh, basically, once we set it up uh, here at Menlo Systems, we can block it, ship it, you receive it, you un unlock the transportation mechanism, and uh, you should uh, be able, by a turnkey, to, to have an operational laser, uh, ultra, uh, ultra stable subhertz la uh, laser, um, uh, with, which comprises here of the, uh, of the cavity assembly of 15 height unit. Uh, temperature, uh, um, uh, pr pressure, uh, iron pump controller, iron getter pump controller. And of course, our uh, uh, embedded system, embedded uh, platform, which is called Synchro, which is completely modular and uh, enables you to, to configure system to your needs, depending on whatever options you want to incorporate with your system. Um, 
this is uh, now evolving towards three height units with a better display, larger display of six inch, etc. So it's a constant improvement of user experience. And uh, yep, uh, so our second uh, uh, flagship system is uh, ORS Cubic. And this comes in two flavors. One is rec uh, mountable eight height unit without, um, without anti-vibration isolation. So this is uh, the, the, the system that is at, at the, the high edge of, uh, of perform or at a low end of performance with the five, 10 to the minus 15. And uh, in the rec, uh, uh, rec scale system, we use uh, anti-vibration isolation platform. And with this kind of uh, device, uh, we can reach uh, depending on the coatings from 0 0.8 to 2.5, uh, 10 to the minus 15. And the, what is important is that this is really, really rigidly mounted. There is no movable elements and this is super transportable and uh, uh, and uh, super small. So if you are having uh, uh, space issues in the in the laboratory, this is the option to go for. And now um, sometimes we are fortunate enough and there is a lot of uh, uh, activity in the lab that we can basically uh, uh, compare uh, multiple super performing systems. And so you can see our top performance that we can reach with crystalline coatings, uh, level of, uh, of the order of uh, low uh, four, uh, 10 to the minus 16. So Every system is different. You can configure, you can choose the coating, you can choose the, the, the mirror substrates. And uh, you can see that uh, in, in order uh, to cover the, the, the performance range of 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 14, we can deliver uh, uh, anything in this range, yeah. But we are quite proud on this result that we are reaching for 10 to the minus 16. And also by uh, by making an optical beat, you can record the phase noise and this is the the, the, the level of, of optical phase noise that you can later use to extract, extract the microwave. And I'm going to quickly be on that. Uh, so if you want to play a little bit uh, 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 on your own, uh, we have also in our offer a uh, standalone cavities, also spacers without contacted mirrors, spacers with contacted mirrors, and uh, vacuum chambers with with uh, uh, optically contacted cavities inside and uh, this is also saving some of your development time at least for the vacuum enclosure and everything and with these we also de uh, deliver uh, in coupling and out coupling platforms and temperature controllers uh, which enable you to uh, to easily uh, couple and observe the light in the transmission with the camera and stuff like that so uh, I would suggest not going completely from zero in designing your laser systems, but at least considering if you want to build system around uh, uh, buying a, a, a standalone cavity, which will save you a substantial portion of, of time. And of course, you will get a, a, a guaranteed performance in terms of, of, of finesse. And, and uh, we also have some options uh, that, that accompany our products. So in order to distribute ultra stable laser line width, uh, we should, uh, we should take care about the Faber noise. So we deliver also uh, Doppler noise cancellation systems um, that, that take care of, the, of all the fluctuations that, uh, that uh, the, the fiber picks up uh, from from the laser source up to the point of, of uh, using it and then also in certain uh, cer cases when when the the user is interested in certain uh, wavelength that is maybe difficult to to deal with uh, and uh, or to guarantee performance we offer uh, uh, frequency doubling modules and uh, we develop systems at, at uh, twice the wavelength and then we can frequency double which is basically what we what we have done for for strontium clocks for for ytterbium clocks uh, etc and then uh, if you are interested in frequency shifting because when you are when you are uh, locking laser to the cavity you are you are uh, having the option to lock to the discrete modes of the cavity, which are free spectral range apart. And this is some uh, 1.2 or three gigahertz in our case. So if you really want to, to hit the, the atomic transition, you need the option to, to shift the, 
the, the laser frequency. So either with AOM where the, the tunability is uh, smaller, but uh, the, the system layout is simple, uh, or with the EOM uh, where you can, you can tune your laser in, in the ranges of, of uh, gigahertz range from, from the uh, frequency of lasers stabilized uh, to the cavity. And then I would like to mention uh, two of the applications very quickly. So um, this is uh, something that Menlo is quite proud of. We can deliver uh, complete systems that are used uh, for, for the realization of the optical clocks. So optical reference, uh, frequency comps, uh, measurement ports, and the stabilization of all of the lasers for, that are needed for the manipulation of the optical clock or manipulation of uh, ions or, or neutral atoms in lattice. So in this particular case, we have an optical reference system whose trans, uh, stability is transferred towards the, the wide spectrum by, by uh, infrared and visible frequency comb, and then seven lasers that are used for uh, a laser cooling, for a clock transition, for repumping, for the lattice, so high, even high power lasers are all stabilized through the comp to, to the uh, optical reference. And then you end up uh, not taking care about the, the photonics part, but you take care about the physics package and uh, you, you are able to, to build an optical clock. And one of the applications, of course, is uh, microwave extraction, as I mentioned uh, probably in the previous, previous presentation. So uh, stability that we can reach in the optical domain with, uh, with our optical reference system can be divided to, to microwave uh, with optical frequency comb, and then we can extract the super silent microwave signals. And uh, I have a small uh, animation to, to demonstrate how it is done. If you take a look at the non-stabilized frequency comb, this does not, uh, it does not have a, a comb, uh, actually a non-stabilized uh, femtosecond laser. It is still not having a frequency comb structure, but uh, let's be a little bit artistic and consider these, these lines as a noise that is still um, uh, complete, that is the spectrum of the non-stabilized uh, femtosecond laser. Then if we stabilize the, the carrier envelope offset frequency of the femtosecond laser, we end up with a, with a frequency comp structure that is breathing. And if we introduce the the ultra stable laser reference and make a beat with one of the frequency comp uh, teeth, we can stabilize this beat frequency by uh, acting on the piezo controller of the frequency comp. And therefore we end up with a, a, a super stable repetition rate of the, of the frequency comp and uh, either uh, uh, that repetition rate or, or some, some harmonic of it, you can use as, as, as a, super stable microwave signal. And in this case, uh, we have reached the, the super, super levels in collaboration with CIRT. Uh, and I'm running out of time. So uh, I will just say that uh, this is the, the, the world record level and uh, it's not easy to, to measure uh, when you are the best in the world. So we had to collaborate with CIRT and uh, find the source to which our source is uh, uh, comparable in performance. And this is the absolute value of noise on a microwave carrier of 12 gigahertz. And then in order to make it to a product, we have compactized it and made it, uh, made it uh, uh, acceptable and transportable. So not a, a National Metrology Institute uh, and laboratory class device. And you can see these two uh, lines of, uh, of uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, um, blue and orange color, depending on the optical reference that you use to, to reference frequency comb and to extract the microwave uh, signal, we can, we can uh, deliver uh, this level of performances and with the, with the high performance cubic cavity that uses anti-vibration isolation, we are really world, world record in the silent microwave extraction. So I would like now to invite you uh, to take a, a, a short um, a polling uh, to, to think about what we discussed and maybe answer quickly our short uh, polling question. And after that, we will have uh, uh, our live demonstration. Thank you. So I would like you to, uh, to, to think uh, for one minute, maybe what is 
important for your application, you can select multiple answers, either top performance, compactness, transportability, or a turnkey solution and uh, automation that we can deliver with this, so automatic locking. And uh, uh, if you are thinking in terms of uh, shorter or longer cavities than, than we have presented here. Okay, maybe a few more seconds. Okay, so uh, thank you for your answers. Uh, I see that we have some high end people um, following us uh, because top performance, yeah. And uh, I see compactness in equal amount of percentage. Yes, this is very interesting and uh, it, this will be very useful for us to think uh, in terms of how to, how to improve our systems. And also, yeah, shorter than five centimeters, we will have some, some development in, in, that, in that domain. So uh, yeah, in, in next two years, I think that uh, we will be working on that. So, uh, thank you very much. And uh, now I would like to um, to show you a, a small, uh, uh, like 17 minute uh, video of uh, of our demonstration, how our systems look in uh, in uh, reality. So uh, let me play the video and enjoy. Okay, so now we come to the live demonstration part of the webinar. We actually uh, set up um, two full OS systems and then we uh, generate Agile MB between the two and we will uh, uh, show you how to lock one of these systems and how to operate it. And uh, furthermore we have uh, two uh, contact cavities here and then also two uh, full systems. And yeah, this is our um, standard uh, product here, uh, which works 24-7 operation. And so yeah, let's get into it. So, as you heard in the webinars, um, the, the actual cavity is at the core of this um, optical reference system. And it's um, a Fabri Perot etalon, which is made of uh, ultra-low expansion glass and has um, mirrors optically contact onto the glass. So here we have two spacers. Um, one is the cubic spacer, uh, which is the design from the National Physical Laboratory. And th this one here is five centimeters long, um, which gives you a free spectral range of the etalon of uh, around three gigahertz. And here we have a notch cavity design, um, also with the two mirrors optically contacted. And yeah, this one here is 12 cm long, so that's a free spectral range of around 1.2 gigahertz roughly. And yeah, so the, this is basically at the heart of the system and the line width of the etalon um, is given basically by the cavity length and by the, the finesse, so basically by the how good, how high the reflectivity of the mirrors um, is. And so typically if you have a finesse of 250k, that means you have a line width of around 5 kilohertz on, on this one, and maybe 10, a bit higher kilohertz on the smaller one. Um, so of course, in terms of absolute performance, the, the smaller line width is better, but uh, um, yeah, it's better. But uh, also depends on the application and and what you need. Okay, and um, so then you already heard what we need to do with these cavities to actually get to the subhertz level. Um, first of all, uh, we have to put it in a vacuum chamber. So here you see 
the vacuum chamber for the, the large cavity. So we have the, the view ports at the input and at the output. Here is a 10 liter per second ion getter pump. And here you have a valve to hook up a turbo pump to initially pump the system. Then for transportation, there is a transport lock here. Uh, where you can basically um, put the cavity in a fixed position within the chamber so that it can be transported. And then once it's in the final location, this is brought down again, the cavity. And uh, there's no need for realignment, so everything is still aligned. And on the, the cubic cavity, uh, it's this vacuum chamber, so it's a lot more compact already. And also with the view ports, a smaller pump here. And so this cavity is hold in four positions. It's rigidly mounted, so that has the advantage. There's no need for um, to actively engage a transportation lock, so it's always tightly uh, locked. And yeah, so we need the vacuum, of course, to uh, um, have a stable pressure within the chamber. Otherwise, you would be limited by pressure fluctuations. Then, as you also heard, this UNE class has um, a zero crossing of the coefficient of thermal expansion. So what we do here at Menlo is um, we beat this system against the frequency comb, which is RF reference, and we change the temperature of the spacer. And uh, what you then basically get is a parabola frequency against temperature, because it's a quadratic dependence. And uh, so we get this parabola, and there's the zero crossing where we're going to operate the cavity later on. Um, and this is also crucial to get these ultra um, low drifts in the spacer. Okay, um, so then what, all, what else do we need to do to get to the subparts level? Um, so we have temperature control and the vacuum. Then you also need to get rid of uh, vibrations within the spacer. So these spacers by design are already um, insensitive to vibrations, which is important. But furthermore, you also need active uh, stabilization of the cavities to cancel out the vibrations. And for this we use uh, active vibration isolation platforms. And this you will find then in the full systems. So. Um, here you can see we have the whole setup and within the setup at the bottom you have these vibration isolation platforms and the system rests on them and they are engaged when the system is operated. Okay, so I would say let's move to the, the full system. I will explain a bit what we uh, see here. So this is the cubic system, which is more compact. And then here we have the cylindrical uh, um, system. And uh, so both identical, they have the eingetter pump controller, and monitor signals, error signal, and so on. It uh, can be controlled by ethernet. And then you also have access USB to a, a camera, which you can monitor which uh, TM mode the cavity is locked to. And then here we have um, the arrow signal and the transmission. So here's actually the TN00 mode. And you see currently the laser is, is scanned and you see the positive horn arrow signal. And then below here is our uh, synchro unit, which is our universal um, control platform. And that can be controlled via Ethernet. So here you actually see um, it's controlled via Ethernet and it uh, can be remotely controlled conveniently, even if you're not in a lab, uh, you can lock the system and monitor everything. Then within the system, there is an uh, MDF box, which also gets rid of um, uh, acoustics, reduces the environmental noise. Then the laser sits in here, it's a Rioplanex laser, which we couple to the cavity via this fiber. And then here you got all the optics to generate the PDH arrow signals. So you got an EUM, photodiode, and just uh, some polarization optics. And yeah, then in here we have um, everything to generate the PDH arrow signal and then also to feedback to the laser. And in that case, we feedback to the current and then a slow loop to the temperature of the laser. 
and yeah, once you lock that, that runs for weeks and months and uh, is 24 uh, 7 operation. Okay, and then the same is true for the Cubic, only that it's uh, way more compact, so you see it's roughly half the size. And of course, we have even more compact systems, so it depends on your application. We also offer systems uh, that don't have the vibration isolation platform. And here uh, we offer systems that come in 8 height unit uh, rack mountable uh, systems, basically. Okay, so um, then what we set up here is basically, so here you have one output here from the cubic, one from the cylindrical, here we just have a 50-50 PM coupler and then we got a photodiode here, which is enough to generate a heteroline lead. And here we have a spectrum analyzer which looks at the signal. And so here you see we have a span of 3 gigahertz. And currently because we're ramping the laser, so this is the optical bead. And because we're ramping the laser you see this 10 hertz um, ramp on the bead. And um, so now we have one cavity with a free spectral range of 3 gigahertz and one with 1.2. So um, then you find your bead when you lock to different cavity modes somewhere below around about 600 megahertz. Okay, and we know that, uh, so this cavity is already locked and this one here is currently being rammed. That's why here we see the PDA Java signal. So this is the, the main mode and this is the sideband. And here the pattern just repeats. And you see here the transmission photodiode signal. And what we see is that you have transmission on the sideband, but of course not on that, sorry, uh, on the main mode, but of course not on the sideband. And then what we want to do is now lock this cavity to the main mode. And um, so I will demonstrate this now. So what we can do is to, so first I will demonstrate here that this has an effect on the error signal. So you see here I can move the temperature and I can move the mode. And if we look on the beat I can also do larger steps. And you see here that I can basically move away the laser from uh, the cavity mode. And I can of course come back again, which I do now. So now in about a couple of seconds the signal should come up again. Yeah. Okay, so here we're back at the mode. And then all you have to do to lock the system is pretty much just the click of a button. So I press this integrator and then I just tune a bit the temperature to actually go to the mode. One second, to the larger step. Okay, so I'm going in the wrong direction. One second, I unlock it again. Go in the smaller step. Okay. Okay, and now if I engage the lock, it should lock. Okay, yeah. So now you can see the system is locked. I can also take it out of lock again. You see the error signal and I can lock it again and what you see is that the transmission increases because now you have uh, light in the cavity transmission goes up and yeah you see that here's the in-loop error signal and this is the transmission and you see here that now the system is basically engaged so this controls the current and now we can also lock the integrator which doesn't work in touch screen unfortunately but like this and so this integrator will now, this is the temperature of the laser, so this integrator integrates the current and then feeds back to the temperature of the laser and like this the system stays locked over weeks. Okay, and uh, so here you see the optical bead and this is a CW bead, so uh, we have a lot of signal to noise it's quite easy and so now what I want to show you next is the typical performance of these systems so um, to make that quicker I prepared the measurements already so I will show you now what the performance looks like so basically um, once you got this hydro bead what you want to do is um, 
you can measure either the phase noise or the frequency stability. So the frequency stability we measure with an FXE counter. Um, for this you have to mix such a meat which is at a couple of hundred megahertz down with a synthesizer um, in the countable range, so somewhere below 60 megahertz say. Um, in that case we mix it down to 10 megahertz. And then uh, here we counted with um, 0.1 second um, sampling time. And here you see we have a trace of 12,000. So that means it's um, uh, 1,200 seconds. And so now what you see here is basically a linear drift. And that is due to the, the shrinking of the cavity. So the cavity shrink over time. And here we have a linear shrinking you always see the difference between the two cavities, but in that case it's uh, roughly 70 millihertz per second. But this can very easily be compensated for, measured by a frequency curve and then compensated for. So this we've done on the next slide. So here the linear drift is um, subtracted and then you see here, um, so here on this scale we have uh, frequency fluctuations uh, in hertz. And you see over like uh, 1,200 seconds, you have a peak-to-peak -peak fluctuation of maybe 15 hertz, so on a 200 terahertz carrier. And now, um, typically, you're calculating something like an uh, allen deviation. So here it's modified allen deviation. And so here first, I calculated in the case where the linear drift is not subtracted. So what we see here at one second, we had 1.7 times 10 to minus 15, so uh, subhertz. And then what you see here is that uh, basically a linear drift kicks in at longer time scales, and that's um, what I just shown you. But this can be easily compensated, and when you compensate for the drift, so what you should realize is now that here the scale changed, so it's on the uh, 10 to minus 15 to 10 to minus 14, while on the plot before was going up to 10 to the minus uh, 13. And now you say we have uh, reduced uh, the long term, so at 100 seconds, it's much lower the fluctuations than before. And yeah, so this is the standard uh, performance that we spec. So at one second, um, depending on what exactly you need, we have uh, some options where you can have uh, better mirrors. Um, you can even go um, in the mid 10 to minus 16 range, but if you use UL mirrors, then typically we spec uh, below 2 times 10 to minus 15, for example, depending on which cavity you have. And yeah, this is the subhertz performance uh, which you can get from these systems. And of course, um, we can not only measure the, the RDEF, but we can also um, measure the line width of the laser. So I told you the, the cavity itself has maybe 5 kilohertz, but because the PDH lock has so much gain, you can actually stabilize the laser to subhertz. And here is the same heterodimine as before. So the way we did this measurement is we um, mixed it down to even lower, say 5 kilohertz. Then we have an, um, uh, an AD card that gets that sine wave. Then we run a fast FFT. Um, and basically this is the line width plot you get out. So here we have a line width of 0.6 hertz roughly. And yeah, this we measure for every system here at Mendel. And we have uh, in-house systems and we characterize every system in terms of stability and line width against our reference. Okay, so uh, this basically uh, finished the presentation and now we are uh, keen to hear questions to the setup. Okay, so thank you Nicola for the illustrative presentation and uh, to Maurice for the system demonstration. And we also thank all our attendees for joining us today. And should any further questions arise, please don't hesitate to contact us. We will be very happy to, to discuss your questions uh, with you. If you would like to receive a Menlo t-shirt also, please send us an email 
the contact is given here on this last slide, or you will also find it in the cover letter, letter um, in the archive that has been sent to you via the link by Sakshi. We will be also very happy to receive your feedback on the presentation on the webinar in our survey. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Nicola. Thanks, Dag and Maurice as well. And thank you all for attending. Um, that is everything that we have for today's presentation. The slide on the screen has the contact information. I've also dropped it in the chat box. Um, you guys have a link to the Dropbox link as well, which includes supplemental data that Nicola has shared with you all. Um, in addition, the link to the recording has been shared in the chat box as well. That should be available online in the next one to two days. Um, so feel free to check back there. The link to the first webinar Menlo did is also in the chat box. You can find that online as well. Um, and if you guys have any other questions for us, um, OIDA at OSA.org. If you're interested in hosting a webinar, if you have any questions about this webinar, please uh, feel free to contact us. Um, I appreciate you all for sticking around a few minutes later, and thank you again to Menlo Systems for sponsoring today's webinar. I will see you guys at the next one.